$57.9 million webinar. That's how much they transacted on a brand new offer, digital offer in 226 days. These are confirmed numbers. That's right. Today's guest is Jason Flathian, who's going to walk you through the entire business setup of how they went from zero, day zero, no, nothing other than an idea to a digital product that has now in 226 days done over $57 million. This is incredible. Listen, towards the end of this, we even go over a massive tip, a massive strategy that I'm applying, that he's applying, that's going to show you the real important part of launching a digital product business that most people, 99% of people never do. It's going to be all in this action packed episode. So get ready, get excited. And of course, learn expert.com L U R N E X P E R T.com free community, free course, free newsletter, all about how to sell more courses, coaching or consulting. Go join us right now. If you're on YouTube, click subscribe, click like right now, leave us a comment. And of course, onicpodcast.com to binge listen to all of our episodes. Now, Let's talk to Jason. All right, here he is, the man himself, Mr. Webinar. So Jason, I'm gonna publicly state this. Uh, when it comes to learning how to do, present, and write webinars, um, I got quite a bit, I got an ego, I got a swagger, and there's probably two people in the world. No, there are not probably, there are two people. There are only, the only two people that I take advice from or look to or hack or watch. You are one of them. So I will definitely tip my hat. Um, that I have watched what you do and on multiple occasions when I watch you presenting a webinar or writing a webinar or whatever, I'll go, son of a bitch, like that was smart. Like this guy, you know, like why did I think of that? And it's very rare that I see that. Um, and then of course being our industry how it is, <laughs> everybody copies it and like becomes like the standard for stuff. But um, we've known each other now for, gosh, I don't know. What are, What is it, seven, eight, nine? Nine years, eight years? Good question. Like seven or eight years at least yeah and so i want to tell everyone the funny story about how we actually met or how i you know went out looking for who the heck is jason so there is a company called amazing.com that used to launch their product back then and um he would just constantly be the number one affiliate by like a lot and i remember the first time i saw him be the number one i'm like who the hell is this like no one in this industry is number one without me knowing who they are like i've been around forever and then i was like yeah whatever the next year again I'm like, what the hell is going on? And by year three, we actually came in and promoted the launch. And of course he was number one again. So now it became really relevant. And we ended up meeting, I think, at an event and just hung out and, and have been friends since then. And I've watched him do some amazing stuff. The most recent. Uh, Onik, my favorite experience during this thing is during that launch is, um, you know, we were number one and you were duking it out with number two and three, like you're going neck and neck. And I won't say who they were, but they were a very famous big name individual. And I was kind of upset at them because uh, they had talked to us about doing something together. And then they took our information and tried to use it against us. Right. Uh, yeah. So I was like, I want Onik to beat them so bad. So I remember that you and I, we, we would get on a phone call and I would talk strategy with you <laughs> in order to beat them, even though you yeah. and I were quote unquote competitors at the same time, because I was just like, I don't, I don't want them to win. And so we really so, got to jam on and we would toss ideas back and forth and we would iterate. So we would build off of each other's idea. And I always saw, I found yeah, that very enjoyable. It was, it was fun. And I'll, I'll tell you the funny story about that is my take on that one was this person that you're speaking of, this famous person is not from our space. This is my home. This is my territory. So I was like, ain't no one beating me in my home or not this person who just came in. And so, so I remember going to a Russell Peters uh, concert or whatever you would say, like a Russell Peters uh, comedy show live in DC. It was the night this thing was closing out. And I almost canceled because I was like, no, that one last email, that one last phone call, that one last something. But I did go because yeah, I want to stay married to my amazing wife. So we went. But while I'm there, dude, my phone is in my hands. The team is messaging me and I'm like, send another email, like do this. And it was just, you know, so it was such a fun thing to do. And I remember then when it was over, <laughs> not me, but my marketing director at the time, actually sent an email to those people, to their team, and the subject line said, nanny, nanny, boo, boo. <laughs> and thank God their team had a good sense of humor, and so they actually laughed about it, but um, I found out about it later. I'm like, what the hell is wrong with you? Why would you do that? Uh, you don't poke a bear. But yeah, that was it's, it's so fun, man. And then recently, I'll tell you what happened, okay? So this is a, this is a funny story, everyone, and we're getting to the point of the 
the uh, podcast today, which is how the hell did he write this $57.9 million webinar? Which real quick, Jason, in what time frame has this offer transacted $57.9 million? Yeah, that's a great question. So, and then we'll talk about the writing of the webinar. So I actually didn't really do much of the actual construction of the webinar this time, but it's important to understand why I didn't need to. But uh, the number is exactly $57,914,510. That's uh, collected revenue if all the rebills follow through. This is just the metric we measure in the industry, right? Now, obviously, it does. they don't all rebuild. We didn't end up with that at the final say, but the way that everybody measures the success of a launch is how much collected revenue with potential future revenue on the books, 57.9 million. And now here's the timeline, 226 days. And why, why I say that very specifically is because this was a, a, an opportunity I had zero understanding of, awareness towards or personal experience in. So that on day one, I'm net new. On day 226, it's $57 million in billables. Uh, so that's the time frame. It's 226 days. So when people talk about launches on it, oftentimes they say, oh, we, we had a million dollar day, but they don't tell you that they spent you know 10 months, eight hours a day to build up to that one day that's a million dollar day. So was it one day that was a, was a million dollar day or was it eight months in one day? Uh, yeah. Something to consider, right? So literally from a standing start, um, we went and we delved into a new opportunity we've never done before in a new space that we weren't in and 226 days later, just the most amount of money I'd ever seen. Yeah. No, that's, that, that is incredible. Um, huge numbers. I have to say, in my opinion, at least from all the ones I've seen, the biggest webinar I've seen do, you know, perform in that time span. So here's my backstory with this and how I got to know about it. I had someone reach out to me and said, Hey, this is exactly what I said. Have you ever promoted crypto? And I was like, the heck? Stop right where you are because I have respect for you. And the next words out of your mouth may mean I never speak to you again. And they're like, listen, I just promoted this. I'm like, you're still talking. And they're, and then I just heard the words Jason Fladlin. And I was like, okay, I'm listening. What? And I remember going into this. And you'll remember, I first was like, okay, maybe. And then I was, and then I pulled out. And I was like, nah, like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not touching this thing. And then I, the thing behind the scenes that kept going on was I was like, yeah, but Jason and, you know, Jason's behind this, like, so eventually we did promote and it was, I think, if not the most successful program I've ever converted, it was in like number 1.2. Like it, it was, I think it was the most, but I can't say that with a surety. So yeah, man, let's talk about this. Give us a background. So for everyone listening, he, there is a webinar that uh, is in the crypto space that came out with a completely different feel, different everything. And 226 days, $57.9 million later. Um, talk me through the story and like, yeah, I'll let you go now. Yeah. It's a fascinating story too, because um, one day I, I get told by Wilson Matos, he's my business partner. We've been in Rapid Crush together um, for over 11 years now as a company. And he says, I need you to come to this meeting. I'm not going to tell you what it's about. And you need to just show up as a favor to me. And when Will asked me favors, I, I do them. And when he was the best man at my wedding, we're that close. We've been working together forever. I trust the man with my life. But he kept it cryptic uh, intentionally. Because if he would have said, hey, it's about crypto like you, Anagata, I would have been like, not dismissive, not interested, because I have a bias towards it. I'm not, I don't think it was legitimate in terms of something that I would ever see myself getting behind, even doing much less publishing and promoting. Um, so he says, but we'll take this call. Uh, so I show up. So I have no idea what it's about. Now, the call is with a gentleman named Dan Hollings. Now, our, our backstory with Dan is kind of fascinated, too, because we've been publishing Dan off and on since 2010. We go way back with this guy. Uh, and Dan came to us initially because Dan was the marketing strategist behind The Secret, uh, the thing that went all over the world, was on Oprah, $300 million in sales or something crazy like that. Um, and so Dan came to us after that whole ordeal was done. Um, and said, listen, I, I just, I want to teach and I want to train and I don't want to have to run a lot of parts of the business. So if you guys will do that and I can teach and train, uh, let's create a, a partnership together. So we said, great. And we publish his intellectual property. We'd help him market it, provide support and logistics and it would work well. So every so often Dan would get an idea and if, and he could totally do it on his own, but occasionally he'd want to 
bring the idea to us to combine capabilities. Uh, and so this was the call. The call was with Dan. And in a few minutes, he immediately cut to the chase and he instantly showed us exactly what he was doing. And I had my automatic aha moment. Um, and that aha moment was Dan is doing this much differently than everybody else. It doesn't even have to be crypto. I don't care what you call it. The strategy involved in the insight uh, that he could demonstrate, I'm like, I know people would want to know about this. And then if they know about this, I think a lot of them would pay money in order to have some guidance towards this if they wanted to go more hands-on with it. it. Whether it was crypto or not did not matter necessarily to me. I saw, I saw a way for people to be helped that they weren't getting right now. Uh, and so this was really exciting. So here's the first thing we did as we did it ourselves. So Will and I took it and we got our own experience with that. And that took us about a month. So we set it up, we let it run for a month. And during, and during that time, we did as much due diligence, due diligence as we possibly could, just like you did on it. So the first time before you uh, promoted us, you did a whole bunch of due diligence. And so we did our due diligence. We thought it was good, but we are cautious in our optimism. We always are. So I said to Dan, I'm like, we got to prove that we can teach this to strangers and that also they have to pay for it. Um, because if we teach it to them for free, even if it works, um, the market might suggest to us that it's not a fair comparison. Yeah, if I teach people that over there for free and they were successful, I taught my friends, I taught my buddies, I taught my business associates, I didn't teach customers like that. And this is really important to understand is the strategic positioning of the offer is to me the most important thing. If the webinar is the ax that cuts down the tree, then the strategic positioning is the sharpening of that ax. So I said, let's see what we can do with that. Uh, and so we made an invitation and we said, we don't know if Dan can teach this. We don't know if we can structure this and specifically deliver on it. It's a very uh, weird topic. It's kind of complicated. It's convoluted. Dan has never formally sat down and teach it. We don't know how deep we're going to go with this or how deep we should, what we should cover, what we shouldn't cover. But if you're willing to be our guinea pigs, uh, then you can join us and Dan will do it one-on-one -on -one with you. Uh, and it'll cost you $10,000. And so we had 53 people apply for that. So that's kind of an indication we already had hit upon something very interesting. Usually I got to kill myself just to get 53 people to want to pay $10,000 for even the most amazing thing in the world. Uh, <laughs> and, and so we got a good audience that I felt comfortable testing and they knew full on this might not work. We might not know how to teach it to you, you know, it, it could go completely sideways. Let's just see what happens. And so these folks came in with us. We ended up taking on 18. Um, I believe it was 18. I don't have, you know, don't hold me to the exact precise number. I'm a fallible human being, but I think it was around 18 people we had come in and Dan showed them one-on-one, -on -one, took them about four hours a piece. And when we were done, every single one of them, I've never seen anything like this in my life, had implemented it and had activity had things going on that looked really nice. Uh, and so, by the way, even if you have people that are willing and capable, 100% compliance is, is, is practically impossible because life will interrupt, people get distracted. Uh, there's just generally attrition. There wasn't in this case. And the initial indications of what was working for them seemed to be very, very compelling. Uh, it was working out better than we had anticipated and what we thought. So immediately, Will says to me, "Because we got to, we got to do this quicker." Um, by this, he means we need to put this in in the market's hands, because I know they're going to want this. I know it's going to be helpful to them, uh, and we're kind of have to be compelled to do this. So we had to figure out real quickly. This is the challenge, right, Onik? We had to figure out real quickly. We don't have a course. We don't have a product. Uh, we don't have a formal offer in place. We don't even have a membership site. We got nothing. Uh, we just got this idea. Can we put it in the market's hands quickly? Because we know they're going to want it and they're going to be upset if they have to wait for it. And that's when we did the first beta launch. Um, and that's really powerful, the concept of, of beta. Because we were able to go out to this audience and say, listen, uh, we don't know how many sessions it's going to take us to teach it. Uh, if we don't teach a, se a session correctly and precisely, we might have to do the session again. This is complicated materials, right? We don't have a lot of experience teaching this. We have these 18 one-on-ones. We have independent, verifiable, third-party data on every active, every active open trade that they have going on right now. And we have their permission to share them with you. And we will share with you 100% of them. Not picking and choosing, not cherry picking, every single one of them. 
We will show you the bad with the good, show you everything. Uh, and so we had that, uh, we had that and people bought that. Uh, and people bought that very eagerly. As you said, it was one of your highest, if not the highest performing conversion opportunities that you ever had. And people were able to implement it too. And that's what really mattered because what happened was Dan actually created the webinar. I had practically zero input on the webinar itself. Uh, Dan essentially came on, he goes, here's my story. Here's a little bit about Bitcoin. Uh, now here is these 18 people we took on one-to-one -one, and here's every single one of their active open portfolios right now in the moment, live right in front of your eyes. And then it was essentially, here's what beta means. Here's the opportunity for you to join. I'm going to teach this live. And then he would make the offer. And then where I would come in is I, I would do a lot of the, the question uh, section of the webinar, which is to me as important as the formal presentation of the webinar, right? And so I would sit with people and help them decide if it was a good decision for them or not. Not whether they, not a yes, it was whether it should be a yes or a no. And so we would do that by helping them understand the information. We'd have them understand the techniques. We'd assess their personal situation and see if it made sense or not. And we worked that out. Uh, and that was that was beta one. And so we, we started that on June 2nd, I think it was. And then we closed it on like June seventh or eighth, uh, and it would happen very quickly. Um, and and we we took an, a couple million dollars, I think, in sales with just a handful. I think three or four or five affiliates, Amazon affiliates, not crypto, not financial people that were Amazon sellers for the most part. That was our audience. <laughs> There's so many lessons we can already impact from this, right? So so let's pause here real quick because to me it sounds like the webinar, the writing of the webinar, this is like one of the few times in which like the writing of the webinar is irrelevant. And much, yeah. it's really just the natural raw story of, you know, it's funny. So I recently, and I think this really applies here because I recently paid uh, a doctor who does functional medicine. I paid their practice a ton of money to come help me and, you know, I want to improve my health and do all that. And I remember being on the call and so this, their, their biz dev or salesperson is taking me through this like call and I was, I was dying. It was like, it was like the most like mind numbingly boring, you know, and that, that's a separate discussion I want to have with them. It was like, you guys, like, that is like the worst sales pitch ever. And do you know, like 32 minutes in, I was like, Hey, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be rude, but like I came onto this call ready to buy and like none of this is necessary. So can we just, can we skip and just like, I don't know, like, do you take my credit card? Do you send me a link? Like, what, what do we do? And I remember when that happened, I remember looking at myself from like outside and I was like, well, that's really interesting. Like you should dissect the marketing behind that because you, you actually, she was talking me out of the sale, if anything, because I was just so bored. But in this situation, that's exactly what happened. The offer is so good and the proof is so solid that the webinar is irrelevant. It just doesn't matter. Once they've seen the transparency, the proof behind it. And so to me, I'm hearing from you, it's like, hey guys, stop worrying about like the power words or the trigger words or the webinar formula and take all that time and energy and throw it into the preparation and proving the concept. Am I kind of summarizing this well? Yeah, it's contextual. We got to keep this in mind because typically this isn't the way that it works, but our primary driver was, was speed of implementation. We, we could see all the indicators that were saying this needs to get out there sooner rather than later. And so how do we make it happen sooner? So Will and I came in with the attitude of uh, Dan will show up with whatever he shows up with, and then we'll see how the market reacts and we'll make adjustments on it. Uh, mm -hmm. Turns out we never really had to make an adjustment on it. Uh, yeah. You can say we got lucky or right market to, to, to message fit uh, with timing and all that kind of stuff. But again, it comes back to that strategic positioning. Uh, Dan had initially wanted to roll it out ASAP and Will had initially wanted to kind of roll it out ASAP as well. And my role, I'm the chief strategic officer at the company, if we want to use formal titles, is I had to say for a second, well, hold on. Here's what I knew. Here's where customers would be resistant. Uh, if we had never formally taught this to anybody commercially, meaning if we had never charged for it before, and this was the first time we were charging, uh, customers would be more hesitant because there's no established value. So that's an issue. The other issue too is, is if Dan doesn't have strangers that he could showcase and he only has friends, that's an issue. Now they're not overcomable. Oh, 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 they're not um, insurmountable, but 
the ability to get that quick proof of concept and then still not oversell it, right? We said, this is beta. We still, here was the close that I use, because again, I'm using all this informally now. So all of this, I think, helped tremendously um, doing these, these closes, if you will, because I would say, here's the thing. We have this unbelievably powerful thing. It, it appears that way, at least, right? Um, if I put it in a paper bag and slid it across the table to you versus if you know I hung it in a museum and made it look beautiful, it's still the same thing. So the material we're pretty confident in, but we haven't built the palace around it yet. We haven't put it in the frame. We're giving it to you in a brown paper bag. And if that's good enough for you and you're ready to act, then join. If you need to have the trappings and all of uh, the accoutrements that are built around it as well, you can wait till later. Uh, we'll charge more as we did. We did increase the price later and you can have those things. But this is for the people that don't care so much about what the gift wrap looks like, but more what's in the box. And people resonated well with that concept. And so, but at the same time, it allowed us to test further. That's not just a marketing gimmick. When we say it was beta, legitimately, it was absolutely beta. Like we did not have a members area. They signed up and said, you're gonna, we're gonna have to wait to get you in a members area because we got to build a members area. Because again, we were compelled that much. The philosophy in this instance, Onik, it was like people are drowning and we could throw them life rafts. Uh, we don't worry too much what color those life rafts are. We don't really who, what the branding of them are, what they look like, right? As long as people can grab onto them and not drown, we're good. Uh, and so that's the attitude in which we came from. Again, not typical, um, but in our case, it was. Now, there was a time it was typical, right, Onik? Um, and you and I have both experienced this. When you're new and you're really zoomed in on a very specific vertical, the demand is so great that you just have to get it out there. So for me, it was article writing, but for you, it was installing a piece of software. I, I mean, I know my history in this market, right? You get this idea one day, it says, people don't even know how to use this software. If they could install it, it would work for them. Uh, so I'm going to just install it for them. And now all of a sudden, it didn't really matter what your sales pitch was, right? You just had this offer that was so incredible that nobody else was offering. And that that filled your calendar up and it filled your pocketbook. No, you're 100% right. Lately, I'm on this new kick more than anything. Before. Like, I think writing a good offer has been something that I just got good at by accident because I was always modeling after other people what they were doing. But I don't actually fundamentally remember ever sitting down and saying, okay, here's how I'm going to write a good offer. I'm going to dissect this avatar, their mind, their problems. I've kind of become accustomed to it. But lately, because here's what's happening in the current landscape, the economy is changing. One can argue recession or not. That's fine. I'm not making that argument. I'm just, it's changing. It's changing very much so. And when the world around us changes, we change. So I was like, okay, how is this going to impact what I'm doing? This is my fourth weird economy cycle. I've been in space for 20 years. And the first thing, Jason, that I went and did, the first thing I went and did is I ripped apart all of my offers. <laughs> and I was like, that's where we're going to start. Because I, people, I want to create an offer that is so damn good that the economy in its current state just doesn't even matter. People just don't care because the offer is so good that if the economy is down, they look at that and say, this will help me when I need it right now. And if the economy is great, they'll say, well, crap, this will help me and it's awesome and I can put time into it. And that's what you're really saying is you guys just had an offer, right? It was just like, it damn well made sense and it had a proof factor behind it. Um, I just wanted to add that to people is just like, yeah, you're right, we started, accidentally or by design with great offers from day one. Um, yeah, but, and you can't, but, here's the challenge with this, right, Onik? It's hard to force. Um, so when we go back to the old Amazon days where you and I were talking about being affiliates, uh, it's like at that period of time, Amazon had created an opportunity that was vast, but yet was under-optimized. What I mean by that is there was a lot of supply there and very little demand. And so if we could help people uh, or sorry, I, I had it flipped around. There was a lot of demand, but very little supply. So it was a changing point in history where there was a, a pivotal period in history where people were shopping less offline and shopping more online. And Amazon had leveled the playing field for somebody that was just starting out. We can't force that. We can't make that happen in a market, uh, but we can observe it and play towards that. And I've, I've observed every 
five to seven years because before Amazon, our big breakthrough was in the WordPress market. So there was a period of time where WordPress powered 25% of the internet and nobody knew about it. <laughs> I mean, they acted like it didn't even exist. And you know, on one hand, there was all the geek speak of WordPress over here. Uh, so people were using it and didn't understand it and didn't use it or didn't know about it. And on the other hand, there was a huge opportunity to bridge that gap. And that's how we started Rapid Crush as an actual software company, um, predominantly building uh, WordPress type of solutions that were effective without you being a, a geek or having to learn all sorts of stuff or that were used for entrepreneur's sake, not for technical sake or not for creative sake alone. Uh, now, you got to keep the lights on in between those. That's why it's really important to know what a good webinar looks like to play to probabilities of working and serving certain avatars and understanding markets. And so uh, our frame of reference, again, was let's find out how the market will take this with the anticipation that we were going to have to go in and really dial it up and optimize it like we traditionally do. It just so happened on this instance that we didn't have to. But it reminded me again, Anik, of something that I had lost touch with is, uh, you know, this is what Steve Jobs says, great artists ship. We ship. We need to ship. As we grow as a company and as we get bigger, we tend to get more process and uh, driven and orientated towards procedure. We ship less. So I'm like, this returned me to my roots of let's get this in, out in front of an audience and let's see how they respond with proper expectation, mind you. We told them. We don't what know what it's going to be, right? What did you say? Ship? Ship. Yeah, great artists ship. They ship it out the door. They don't keep it in oh, the laboratory, okay. like, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Got yeah, it. with a P, not a T. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, both, I guess. But yeah. Ship. So, okay. so here's an interesting cycle. So I've been thinking about this a lot lately. There's this concept called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Have you ever heard of it? No. So the Dunning-Kruger effect that says the more the, the less you know, the more confident you are in your conclusion. So if you want to see people that have the Dunning-Kruger effect hop on Twitter and people will tell you exactly what's wrong with society and exactly what to do to fix it, even though they have no qualifications whatsoever, uh, the less you know, the more confident that you're in, that you are with your decision. So when I started, I thought I knew a lot when I, I knew a dangerous little amount about business. I knew very few ways in which a business can go sideways. I now know thousands of ways <laughs> in which a business can go sideways. So when I started in business, I was super confident and that I could just put an offer out there and just go forward and make it work. And I didn't really worry about the lesser details because I didn't even know you were supposed to worry about it. And then, you know, you get bigger along the way and things get more compl complicated and more convoluted. And now you have more to lose if you don't do it right. And now you know more of the nuances and the complications. So now you don't know three ways to write a headline. You know, 103 ways to write a headline, right? You don't know just three ways to drive traffic. You know, 103 ways to drive traffic. And now you're determining which of these 103 ways is the right way for this fit in this market at this time, yada, yada, yada. So pretty soon uh, you become less confident the more successful you get and you slow down and you're not as present and you're trying to be more purposeful and calculative. And so the good breakthrough that we got through the other side of it is we felt like we were a grassroots organization again, because again, the situation seemed to demand it. So we, it was easy for us to do it, but it really realigned me with when I'm at my best is when I put offers in front of people at the very beginning and say, listen, this is the essence of the offer. It's not necessarily pretty yet. I haven't developed a logo for it yet. I don't have a brand color scheme for it yet. I haven't figured all that stuff out yet, but here's the concept. Here's the idea. Test it with me. I'll give you a huge discount if you test it with me, and I'll give you more than I normally would for the price to overdo it to see what happens, but I need you to try it out. If you're an early adopter, great. If not, you can wait. And when you set those expectations properly, that's where it gets really excited because when you're new, you don't set those expectations because you're like, I will do whatever it takes because I got nothing else going on in my life uh, to make it work. And you have to sell from that state of confidence and then figure out how to make it true. Uh, now it's kind of like we knew we could confidently do it, but we were great. Uh, we were able to downplay it and to see what happened. So we end up launching three beta cycles. We did beta one, two and three um, really quickly before we did an official launch with an actual members area that was custom coded from scratch that had some of the additional things. But now we were optimiz optimizing based upon experience and observation, not based on theory. We just saw where the people needed help. We saw where we needed to go a little bit deeper. We were also able to scale up support 
Uh, so we we went from like uh, 30 support agents to 52 support agents within the span of three or four months. Um, wow. So we were able to do additional things like that along the way. But how were you able to scale support agents so quickly? Did a particular site you use, particular country, particular hiring mechanism? I have a will, right? So this is the nice thing about having a business partner is he he goes over there and handles support and I handle strategy. <laughs> so the short answer is I have no idea. Uh, but the longer answer is we did have a process in place for a long time because we did have a lot of support agents. Uh, so we were just able to amplify that even further. And uh, also we had Dan, Dan brought his own team in there too, which was really nice. So he had six or seven or eight people uh, on two tier support that we could escalate to. So it was kind of like a partnership of two companies that came together. Uh, but it was really great to lay the foundation of support. We could calculate how much additional support we would need based off the, the initial. But again, when we sold the initial people, it was kind of like, we're still figuring out what kind of support is needed in terms of we're still uh, expect slower than normal support because we got to document this stuff and we got to know the best way to support you. Again, the benefit is you become an early adopter, you get a discount, but you know, we're flying the plane as we're building it at the same time. And when everybody's on board with that, it's really, it's, it's really nice. It's really enjoyable. Uh, it allows you to just pursue it and serve as opposed to worry about expectations too much and this and that. Of course, we always take care of the customer. We always do what's right. Um, but we, we set this foundation of let's go on this journey together where most marketing is, I'm going to do this for you and you're going to do that for me. Uh, we made it more, I don't know, we're on the same side and I felt really good. Got it. No, I, I, I love that. You, you said a lot of stuff. It was really interesting what you said about the size of an organization making it so that you become less nimble. And it's something that I've actually dealt with because I'm most lethal in a good way in a unorganized, anarchy-filled, crazy place because I'm able to adapt very quickly to what the market is saying and make changes. And that becomes a really difficult thing to scale because a lot of other people are not. Most people are not functional in that environment. And so they like to put procedures and policies and and things. And it, it did get, first of all, it gets less fun. So if someone is truly entrepreneurial, it stops making it fun. And when it things don't when things aren't fun for true entrepreneurs, they tend to stagnate and do bad things because they're just, they're bored. But the bigger thing for us has been like, I think you're not creating anymore. And so we actually have also been doing a little bit of a reset so that we could get back to creative mode. And I mean, we were talking before this thing started about WebinarCon and me stepping back into that. I mean, when we created the WebinarCon brand, man, we decided one month to do it. And the, it's so crazy because we were like, well, we have to do the event the first event in March at this date. I don't even know why we decided that that was the date we had to do it, but it ended up being that that was five days before the entire country shut down um, from COVID. So it was like, wow, we picked a great date, but now it was like we had two months to take this event and to convince people to pay thousands of dollars per ticket. Um, and it was the crazy, I think back, I'm like, what the hell made us think we could, we could do that in two months? But we did it, we did that plus much more and that was fun, stressful, but fun. And like, I, I like what you're saying. Sometimes, you know, I'm, I would say to people listening right now, maybe you should create a little bit of urgency, even if it doesn't exist and find a reason to create a little urgency to put, move those timelines, compress them so that you're being forced to ideate quicker, you know, and, and have different versions. Okay, so real quick, I wanna, I wanna take a step back. You said three betas. So I like the fact and that you're talking about that. Hey, listen, we didn't just wake up one morning and 57.9 million popped out. There was like all this strategy side of it, all this build up, and then we tested that. Then we built up more and tested that, and we built up more. And so you had the students and three betas. So it's actually kind of like four, right? If you include the, if you say the 18 students were a beta, so it's like four betas. Um, what did what is the webinar like? So let's like, like I know it wasn't that important, but you kind of went through it really quickly before. What's what does it look like? Walk me through the webinar a little bit. All right. So uh, if it's me, like if we're doing it for a bunch of affiliates where they all mail for one webinar, then I do the introduction. Otherwise, uh, if you're hosting it, like when you promoted it on it, you did the introduction. What's really great is almost every single one of our affiliates was doing the program. So we sat down and we made it a priority to help affiliates have experience. Um, and have their own 
crypto automations running that they could show. So that's part of the introduction. And then Dan comes on and he talks about how he discovered this in like 2017. And then what he went about to optimize for it, um, how he informally taught it to friends and as associates. They urged him to, to publish it, which he wasn't planning on doing. Uh, and so he reached out to us because that's we've always published him when he looked for somebody to publish him. So he tells that story of how we came into being. Uh, and then he shares why he's deciding to show it today and then his own personal results and, and kind of a high level view of how it works and how it works in a little bit of a background on crypto, although not as much as you would think. Um, we didn't get into the weeds too much. And then he says, here are the 18 betas um, or one on one betas. Here's all 18 of them. And what he did is that's how he taught. He would show them, well, this is a, this is what a coin pair looks like, because here's here's all these coin pairs. We're showing you every single coin pair that they have actively. Uh, when you see the, the daily average trading time, uh, that's what he calls the wiggle rate. And here's what the context of that is. So instead of teaching on a slide deck uh, or teaching from principles and concepts, he taught showing in the moment what was happening. Uh, and that was really powerful. And then he just he just essentially said, here's what we have. If you want to go further with us, here's what it's about. Uh, here's how you can sign up for it. Here's the price of it. Here's the additional things you'll also need to invest in. Uh, and then he did his typ the typical straightforward close. And then that's when I would come back in and spend another hour or two or three. Because it doesn't matter if we mention it in the presentation or not, Onik, people would ask about taxes um, and, and how taxes relate to this. They would ask about if I'm in this country or that country, would it work versus if I'm in somewhere else? And a uh, hundred or a thousand other questions, it felt like, which is really good because we didn't have to cram all that in a presentation. If we did, I don't think it would help. I think it would hurt. Uh, but also at the same time, we were capable of answering those questions. And that placed a lot of faith in the people that we had on the webinar um, in order for them to say, yeah, OK, I feel good about this. I'll try this out. Uh, we also made them sign a non-disclosure agreement, um, which is not typical. <laughs> so we would have to spend some time explaining why is there a non-disclosure agreement uh, and, and what our refund policy was, which is your typical three day right of rescission refund policy. Nothing more than that. Uh, it's pretty much a commitment and you have to sign a user agreement. So you, not only do you sign a very specific agreement that says this is what our expectation is of you and here's what your expectation is from us. Uh, here's what we're going to do for you. Here's what you're going to do for us. You acknowledge and you sign that. Uh, but then here's a non-disclosure agreement where you don't go out there and you, you don't share the proprietary information that's taught in here, which will make the sale much harder. But we were willing to lose sales because we wanted to maintain the integrity of the program for those that were in it. And we wanted them to make fully, absolutely sure that they knew what they were signing up for. So, you know, we sold 16,000 some odd people, I think it was at the end of the day, 17,000, something like that, a significant amount when all was said and done. And we got 16,000 signatures from 16,000 people. And we verified every single one of those. So this is the power of when you do have a top heavy organization, when there's a lot of people, you can do things like that. Uh, but those were, those aren't the things that dictated the sales. Those are what we wanted to do to make sure that people fully understood what they got into, could go into this eyes wide open. And at the same time, you know, this is really powerful stuff. And so it should only be available to those who have invested in it. And we fight to make sure that's the case. But yeah, I'm sure there were people that were scared to join us, uh, especially initially because they didn't have that parachute that they could bail out on if they wanted to. Um, and we were OK with that. Now, we, we, we thought in beta, this is kind of funny, Onik, this is why I like doing beta. We thought in beta that we would do a not, no refund policy in the sense of no 30 day money back guarantee, not your standard stuff, because it was beta. And I would tell people flat out on the call, I'm saying, you know, you ever see a Yelp review where you go to a restaurant and they say, best food I ever ate, five out of 10. Why five out of 10? Because they were doing some reconstruction in one quarter and there was some dust in it, right? So the food was the greatest they've ever experienced, but the damn renovation made it a five out of 10. Uh, so I said, I don't want to deal with those types of people right now because it is going to be messy. I just want the people that are willing and are okay with that. Uh, so, so that was our intention. But what we had discovered is we felt that it was in everybody's best interest with how they showed up, how they attended, how they focused once we got that experience. Because I'm generally a 30-day a money back kind of guy. Uh, but in this instance, based on observation through real world customers, we decided it was better for the integrity of everything involved to continue that way. 
And that's how we did it. So the webinar is unremarkable in a lot of ways, but I will tell you why it works so well, because we're not the only one that was in the crypto space at the time. There was a lot of other people and nobody did what we did, um, is that Dan had a unique way, uh, a unique slant on crypto. And that's what he taught on the webinar, basically his viewpoint. And people instantly saw, oh yeah, this is different than what I've heard. This is different than what everybody else is saying. And then when we validated that by showing at any given time with 18 people, if, if 18 people are each running five automations, that's almost a hundred automations. So we're showing a hundred examples, a hundred, or even sometimes more than that. It depends on how many they had open at any given time, plus all of Dan's and plus mine. Uh, oftentimes I showed mine uh, and, and, you know, the affiliate, if it's you on it, you're showing yours too. Right. So the, 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 the attendee would walk away with like 120 live statuses on exactly in that moment what those portfolios look like. Uh, and they've never seen that before. So you want to talk about dramatic demonstration. If, we're, if we want to deconstruct this from a webinar psychological point of view, uh, all good webinars have a dramatic demonstration in them. Uh, and that was our dramatic demonstration, if you will. That was our version of the building maze of like, hey, you can put this on and you can run over it with a, a car and it won't hurt my hand, you know? <laughs> so... So here's a question for you, right? Because there is something about this offer that's unique. Um, that opportunity to have that type of dramatic demonstration. Um, it's something that can be activated very quickly. It's like you said, not every program you ever want to launch in your life is going to have a four hour to implementation type of uh, thing, or maybe it will. So one question for you is, what have you learned from this that you're going to damn well apply to your next one? So let's say, Tomorrow or the next day, you've got someone knocking on your door. They're ready to, they've got this killer idea thing. They want to publish. What have you learned from this one that you're going to say, uh -uh, I'm doing it this way because of that? What are those steps that you're going to forcefully, forcefully go through? Yeah, I'm going to put it through beta first. I want to see real world customers interact with it and see where it thrives and where it needs help. Um, then I, the way I, the, then the idea is how do we do that in a way that is economically viable for us? and is helpful to the customer, the right type of customer? How do we single out that customer who thrives in beta, but allows us to stress test the system? Uh, that's where my attitude is coming from, because then when I roll it out in mass, I'm able to know more through the experience than I ever could just doing standard, technically correct webinar stuff where I'm like, okay, this is what makes a good opener. And this is how I create demand. And this is how I handle objections, right? That's that's academic. I want real world experience as much as I possibly can. And I want it as quickly as possible. So that's the first thing. Uh, by the way, I think most of the offers won't get out of that beta phase. So I'm imagining my hit rate is going to be like one out of five. Uh, but that's okay. Because even the other four, I still can make money with those and customers can still be happy with that process. We'll still take care of them, but we'll know sooner rather than later, should we uh, invest tr a tremendous amount of resources to that or not? You know, Anik, you know this as much as anybody, how customers are a weird species. Um, you could have objectively the very greatest thing ever that could help them. But if they think that thing is weird, they won't use it. So just because it's good objectively doesn't mean it will work subjectively in the world that we live in. So I want to, again, I want to, I always want to validate it in the market. It could be the greatest idea, or it could be a basic idea, but everybody else is going complex and it's what's simple that works. And because it's simple, these people now feel good about it. Uh, but sometimes people won't believe it if it is simple. So even if it's simple, you got to almost complicate it just so they'll believe the damn thing, right? <laughs> and so I want more of that. I want to put more things into smaller groups of people, observe them before we roll them out. And then when we roll them out, we know what to optimize and we know what to get out of the way of. Uh, and so that's that's what I'm really uh, looking for. Yeah, it's a level of it's a level of patience. This requires a level of patience that many, many people don't have. But to those of you who are out there wondering what separates the boys from the men or the girls from the women. This is it. This is what it is. This is where I'm going to just if anyone knows, like, is this Jason's thing only? Nope, this is my thing. So I'll give you a prime example. Um, I had someone, so I've been doing a lot of commercial real estate investing and I've been kind of talking about it, but not really. It's my thing. It's, it's a me thing. I'm loving it. 
freaking obsessed over it. And so every now and then it comes out. I mention it on my, my Facebook group. I mention it here on a podcast, whatever. And the last few weeks, for some reason, I'm getting a lot of people hitting me up and saying, hey, I want to invest alongside you. Like, I want to give you money, you know? And it's, it's actually been kind of like, wait, what? I'm not doing that. These are just my deals. I'm buying on myself. And so I had someone to ask me this the other day. They said, well, I don't understand. Why don't you just buy your deal too, but buy the other one and let us all invest alongside with you for that. And I remember looking at them and I was like, I could do that, but I'm still learning the ropes. Like I, I don't have an answer to every question for you in this world right now. Like I'm still learning it and it's awesome and I'm having fun that I'm not ready yet. And I remember as I said that, I was like, whoa, that's maturity as an entrepreneur because the me 20 years ago would have been like, great, send me the wire. <laughs> like, here, you know, I'll figure it out as I go. But you're right. I've learned a lot, right? Like I've learned like the 17 ways or the 1700 ways that could go wrong. So it's like, let's, so the patience to any new business, and I'm doing this with not just that business. I'm doing it with other ideas I have. We just, uh, just yesterday had another idea for a company that I've, that I'm super excited about nothing to do with our space. And I'm talking to one of my team members and I was like, great, well, we get to test it this way for the next six months. And she was like, what? And I'm like, yeah, I want to actually have a lot of live conversations with people, sell it to them, get on the phone with them and deliver it in this like very unformed, raw way and just see how they react to it until we go further. So I, if there's one big takeaway for people listening right now, that's the biggest takeaway I want you to take from this podcast so far is whatever idea you've got, how can you just slow your roll a little bit? Like I want you to add urgency. So compress time, but also at the same time, slow your roll enough to know like, what's the beta that you can do? How can you go out and test it and actually talk to humans? Like that's, that's a great takeaway, Jason. Um, yeah, um, Anik, the way I think of it is more urgency locally and less urgency globally, right? So we get the excitement of that startup again. Like let's roll this out there. Let's see what happens. Let's break some eggs to make an, an omelet, right? Uh, but at the same time, at a higher level, we're patient. We're like, let's make sure before we know to really roll this out, that it makes sense to roll it out, that the opportunity costs, we've an, we've analyzed that and we've got experience on it. So we get the we get our cake and eat it too. Uh, and so it's accelerating and it's fun and it's fast again. Uh, but we are very cautious on a high level because we, we have now learned that it, all the marketing can be great. We could have the best offer in the world and the best marketing that backs it and the thing could still fall apart. Uh, and that's a lesson that I've had to relearn hundreds of times, it feels like at this point in time. And so this is the this is the antidote to that is let's figure it out. Because sometimes you can have a half cocked message where it isn't refined and you can have an offer that isn't dialed in just yet. But for some reason, the market just responds to it abnormally in a way that you wouldn't even imagine or could never uh, predict. Um, so let's figure that out. Now it's, and again, the urgency is quick. How do we get this in people's hands as fast as possible to figure out what happens? And let's let them in on the story so they know that this is what's part of it as well. I just did a whole consult with a guy the other day where I told him, I go, this is your message to your market. I said, do not use any marketing language because then they will expect a certain type of outcome. Instead, you have to say to them, you don't say, hey, this is a special uh, deal that I'm putting together for you to try to test this out with me. You just literally say, I don't know what's going to happen. My hunch is that this is going to work really well, but I've never done it before. So I might mess up the tech. Uh, it, it might be messy uh, and it might take me a while to get there. We might have to do it again. Uh, however, though, if you're willing to risk it with me, I think if it goes right, that it's going to be just the thing that you need. Uh, check it out if you want to. Um, not a compelling marketing message, but it's not supposed yeah. to be. It's supposed to be, hey, let's try this out together and see what happens. It's encompassing. It's exciting. Uh, and, and I think the world needs more of that, especially right now. So I think the timing of this is greater than ever, too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I love it. Well, Jason, where can people go to follow more of you, your trainings, and maybe throw some money at you or just learn more about what you do? Please throw some URLs, social media out. Where can people go? Amazon. You're going to go <laughs> to get one to many. So, I, you know, I checked it. I don't know why I looked at it this morning, Onik, but it's a number one bestseller in, out, in outsourcing. I don't know how or why that happened. Somebody, a lot of word of mouth of this book. But if you go to Amazon and you look up one to many, it is the Bible that I wrote on webinars where 
we talk about like all the record breaking webinars I had wrote up until that point in 2018 and the mechanics and the persuasion behind them and the positioning and that all of it flows from st strategic positioning. So if you want a master class in persuasion for $9.99 on Kindle, I get that book one to many. Let's keep it a bestseller on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome, man. Congrats on that. That's great. And I definitely, I've not read it yet. I did not know you had a book. So I want to go grab that and read it for sure. So everyone go to Amazon. Let's help Jason out one to many. And then the rest of you, come on, leave him a comment below. If you're on YouTube, hit subscribe, hit like. And if you're on any of the other platforms, make sure you subscribe and leave us a great review for this podcast. Jason, this has been awesome, man. Thank you for sharing the story of what I believe is the largest and fastest growing information product or or just digital product launch that I've seen ever. And I've been in this space for 20 years. That says a lot. So congrats on that. Congrats on all your success and all the future stuff. We'll have you back. Thanks so much. And I think I get a chance to see you the soon here at WebinarCon. So it'll be fun to, so, to yeah. see you at that too. So uh, awesome stuff, everyone. Make sure you go to Amazon, grab his book, learnexpert.com, L-U-R-N-E-X-P-E-R-T. Free community, free course, free newsletter, all about how to sell more courses, coaching and consulting. And of course, onicpodcast.com to binge listen to all of our amazing episodes like this one and many more. All right, everyone, have a great, great, great day, morning, evening, whatever you're doing, go kick some butt, do a beta. This is Onyx God reminding you when life pushes you, stand straight, smile and push it the heck back. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to The Fighting Entrepreneur with your host, Onyx Singal.